It is May 1st of 1943. An American B-17 of the 306th Bomb Group has been hit badly and is on fire. Now, due to the damage and melting metal, she is about to break in half. But on board is one American hero, a ball turret gunner, who is about to undertake a series of actions that will go down in history and lead him to be awarded the Medal of Honor. But the question for today is how did this happen? How did this B-17 find itself in this predicament? And how did one unexpected hero save the men who didn't care for him at all? Let's dive into the records, discover the real story, and find out. What if I told you that you could be in control of one of the world's great armies, deciding the strategy and leading your forces to victory or defeat? Well, thanks to this video's sponsor, Warpath, now you can. Warpath is a massive multiplayer game for mobile and PC that puts you in the war room calling the shots. Using real-time strategy and real-life tactics, you can train new units, form new alliances, and try to gain territory and defend your own bases against attack with real historical weapons and vehicles. But not only will you have to call the shots, you'll have to make them as well in their immersive sniper feature where you are behind the trigger and you have to take out key targets to turn the tide of the war. In addition, they also have a minigame called Tank Tower 2, where you compete to stack the highest tower and earn in-game and real-life prizes, with the top players on their leaderboard earning hundreds of dollars in real rewards. So see if you have what it takes to win the war. Aim your rifle and be the savior of the battlefield with Warpath today. And use the code SNIPER24 for extra in-game resources. Join 35 million other players and play for free at the link below. Thanks again to Warpath, and now, enjoy. In August of 1942, a 31-year-old man enlisted in the United States Army. His name would be Maynard Harrison Smith. Smith, already 31, was far from the normal enlistment. Not only was he about 10 years older and six inches shorter than most of the other young men in the Army, but he also came from what one might call a controversial background. By this time in 1942, Smith had already been married, twice. He had also been divorced twice as well. And to add to the intrigue of his background, there is even a story that supposedly states that Smith had failed to make child support payments. And when he was in front of the judge, he was either offered jail time or enlistment in the U.S. Army. Shortly after which, he was photographed by the local paper, leaving for his service still in handcuffs. Now, while I wasn't able to find that photo, I was able to find this in the divorce sections of a local paper on September 3rd of 1942, stating that Helen Smith was separating from Maynard H. Smith on grounds of cruelty and non-support. And this was only three days after he enlisted in the army. So while I cannot confirm the old story to be true, it certainly does seem to be based in fact. But regardless, Maynard Smith was off to join the war in 1942. Just a few months later, he was headed to the Aviation Cadet Training Program. And here, in March of 1943, we can see that things are actually going quite well. Private Maynard H. Smith, 22, of North Platte, Nebraska, son of Mrs. R. W. Smith, has arrived at the University of Minnesota for the course in Army Air Force instruction, lasting approximately five months prior to his appointment as an aviation cadet in the Army Air Forces. Smith had, at this point, decided that he would like to be a gunner, likely because it was a way to quickly earn a higher rank and more pay. After qualifying and passing the tests here, he was trained and assigned to be a ball turret gunner a cramped and dangerous position that protected the bottom of the aircraft from fighter attack. It was, however, likely the perfect spot for someone standing 5 foot 4. In addition to a new position though, shortly thereafter, Smith was also sent to his new unit, the 306th Bomb Group. Here, this group of American flyers was equipped with the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress, which at this time in early 1943 was a fairly new bomber, but it would quickly gain a reputation as a rugged and durable aircraft, and would no doubt be the reason that he would survive the famous mission to come. But Smith would not be instantly put into action. 
When he arrived at his airfield in Thurley, England, fellow crew members quickly learned what many others had. That what Maynard Smith lacked in height, he clearly made up for with an obnoxious temperament. He was quick to anger and often viewed as stubborn by those around him, so much so that he gained the nickname Snuffy Smith after a popular comic strip character of the time. Because of this inability to get along with other airmen in his squadron, it would be six full weeks before Smith was assigned to his first mission. But when this finally came and he was thrown into a crew for his first assignment, it would be one to remember. And his crew would be beyond grateful to have him on board of their plane. This mission would be May 1st of 1943. As Smith entered the briefing room this morning, he no doubt felt the tense air as the board was revealed, showing their target was the docks of St. Nazaire, also known as Flak City. This would likely not be a milk run, as the submarine pens here at St. Nazaire were well defended by experienced anti-aircraft crews. But the short little man they called Snuffy didn't bat an eye and crawled into his bomber, ready for his first taste of combat, after six weeks of waiting. He didn't care that none of the other crew members liked him. He was used to it. He simply knew that his job was to get on board of the bomber and fight. So that is exactly what he did. Now, as the bombers are starting up and taking off, we can take a look at the mission report for May 1st of 1943. We can see here that the planned route for this raid was no simple flight. Contrary to popular belief, the mission paths for many of these bombing raids were anything but straight. They often involved many turns along the way, as we can see here in the planned flight to St. Nazaire. These were typically done for a few reasons. First, there were often specific cities or targets that had become known for having heavy flak and anti-aircraft. So if the American commanders could, they would always try to avoid flying over these cities and go around them instead of straight over them on the way to the target. In addition, this tactic also made it harder for German interceptors to determine where exactly the American bombing formations were headed. If they flew in a direct path, it would have been much easier for the Luftwaffe to put up larger defensive numbers in areas along their anticipated route. But these tactics also made things a little bit more difficult for the Allied bomber crews and the mission on May 1st would be clear evidence of that. As we can see, the route taken by the 306th on the way to St. Nazaire on May 1st involved quite a few turns. But if that wasn't hard enough, let's take a look at their planned return flight. We can see the mission path here from another raid to St. Nazaire on January 3rd of 1943. Here, after striking the target, the B-17s were supposed to continue over the Atlantic Ocean before turning right to head back towards England, traveling over the water the entire way, far from the dangers of the French coast. This was no doubt to protect the bombers, as there were no real threats from flak or fighters over the open water. But with no landmarks, it did make navigating much more difficult. And as we can see here, in the actual mission route on the May 1st mission flown by the 306, there would be one major mistake made while trying to follow this flight path. As we turn the page on the mission report for the May 1st raid to St. Nazaire, we can see the formation assignments. And here we can see the lowest and most vulnerable aircraft in the entire group, B-17-649 flown by Lewis Page Johnson, who was a veteran captain flying his very last mission of the tour. And also on board of this B-17, now crawled up into the ball turret, was Maynard Smith on his very first mission. After a few quiet hours, the flight was well over France. There was scarce flak and fighters were almost non-existent. An overcast sky near the target caused the bombing to be mostly inaccurate, with many of the explosions seen in the water around the docks. But even the lethal flak from St. Nazaire seemed to be having an off day, hitting none of the fortresses of the 306th. So at this point, what was normally a dreaded target had turned out to be quite an easy raid, 
as the bombers continued out over the Atlantic for the long flight home. But quietly, at the front of the formation, a problem was developing. The lead aircraft for this raid was flown by Group Commander Claude Putnam, who was such an esteemed leader that he can be seen here with the Queen of England in front of one of their B-17s during her famous visit. He was a seasoned flyer and exactly who one would want on a raid like this. But around this time, he had to deal with a problem that would be difficult for even an experienced leader. The radio compass and command set went out on his B-17, making navigation essentially impossible. Putnam's navigator thought that they were closer to England than they truly were, and thus they slowly brought their B-17 to a lower altitude, as was scheduled for their approach to England. Soon below 5,000 feet, Putnam's lead aircraft made a hard right turn as the coast was spotted. As the land was quickly getting closer to their nose, he brought the formation down to less than 1,000 feet to begin final approach and landing. But then, suddenly, a burst of flak broke the silence of the air. Out of nowhere, the sky was filled with anti-aircraft fire. In seconds, it was clear this was not England, but German-occupied France. This meant that the port below them was not England, but Brest, the heavily defended port city. It was a nightmare scenario. The 306th bomb group was currently at 800 feet of altitude, coming in very slowly as if on approach to a heavily armed German fortress. There were currently German anti-aircraft units as well as coastal patrol boats opening up on the low flight. Their fire was heavy and obviously, at such a close range, extremely accurate. But also, at this time, another group of aircraft appeared in the air. These would also not be friendly, but German fighters scrambled to intercept the low-flying American fortresses. At this point, it was essentially a turkey shoot, and the fattest turkey at the lowest altitude was Aircraft 649 with Maynard Smith on board. The intercepting German fighters that were now diving in would be Focke-Wulf 190s, which quickly pounced on the vulnerable prey. This was quite a welcome to the war for Maynard Smith, as he began to open fire from his ball turret, trying to spray German fighters and anti-aircraft units just below their aircraft. But their efforts would do little to thwart such an easy attack for the German defenders. In quick succession, two different B-17s were shot down from the group. The first went down in flames, with all 10 crew members killed. The second would be hit badly and ended up ditching in Brest Harbor, with four surviving. Quickly, Lieutenant Colonel Putnam realized the error and immediately turned the group around, but they were already in deep trouble. The anti-aircraft continued from the German boats near the coast, and the fighters, which had full fuel tanks, continued their attacks long after their initial passes, even following some of the bombers up to 20 miles over the Atlantic. What happened next, particularly to Aircraft 649 and Maynard Smith, is beyond my own words. So instead of trying to articulate it, I will let Maynard tell the story himself, directly from an interview that he gave just a few days later. We had left Brest and were headed out to sea with some 190s tailing us. I was watching the tracers from a Jerry fighter come puffing by our tail when suddenly there was a terrific explosion. Just like that, boy, it was a pip. My inner phone and the electrical controls to my turret went out. So I hand cranked myself up and crawled out of the turret into the ship. The first thing I saw was a sheet of flame coming out of the radio room and another fire by the tailwheel section. Suddenly, the radio operator came staggering out of the flames. He made a beeline for the gun hatch and dived out. I glanced out and watched him hit the horizontal stabilizer, bounce off and open his chute. The poor guy didn't even have a May West. I think it was burned off. Now, by this time, the right waist gunner had bailed out over his gun and the left waist gunner was trying to jump but was stuck half in and half out of his gun hatch. I pulled him back into the ship and asked him, is the heat too much for you? All he did was to stare at me and say, 
I'm getting out of here. And I helped him open the rear escape door and watched him bail out. His chute opened okay. The, uh, the smoke and gas were really thick. I wrapped a sweater around my face so I could breathe, grabbed a fire extinguisher and attacked the fire in the radio room. Glancing over my shoulder at the tail fire, I thought I saw something coming and ran back. It was Gibson, the tail gunner, painfully crawling back, wounded. He had blood all over him. Looking him over, I saw that he had been hit in the back and that it had probably gone through his left lung. I laid him down on his left side so that the wound would not drain into the right lung, gave him a shot of morphine and made him as comfortable as possible before going back to the fires. And I just got started on this when that 190 came in again. I jumped for one of the waste guns and fired at him. As he swept under us, I turned to the other waste gun and let him have it from the other side. He left us for a while, so I went back to the radio room fire again. I got into the room this time and began throwing out burning debris. The fire had burned holes so large in the side of the ship that I just tossed the stuff out through them. Gas from a burning extinguisher was choking me, so I went back to the tail fire. I took off my chute so I could move easier. I'm glad I didn't take it off sooner because later I found that it had stopped a 30 caliber bullet. I fired another burst with the waste guns and went back to the radio room with the last of the extinguisher fluid. When that ran out, I found a water bottle and a urine can and poured those out. After that, I was so mad that I urinated on the fire and finally beat on it with my hands and feet until my clothes began to smolder. That FW came around again and I let him have it. That time he left us for good. On May 1st of 1943, during his very first mission, Maynard Smith was very quickly put out of action in his ball turret gun over Brest. When he arose from the position, his aircraft was in flames and multiple crew members were attempting to bail out. But instead of joining them, he took on multiple jobs fighting the Germans from the waste guns, fighting the fires in the fuselage, and tending to his injured tail gunner, who was critically wounded. For over an hour, he alternated between each of these responsibilities, saving not only his gunner, but the rest of his crew as well. The details of his heroics, however, were not only from his own mouth. A nearby B-17 in the group watched the entire story unfold flying in the forts on the wings of Lieutenant Johnson's ship with Maynard Smith was the ship flown by Captain Raymond Check, who has since been killed. They were closest to the ship in which the story took place. Uh, we could see the stubby little ball turret gunner working feverishly, head bobbing as he tossed a load of stuff out the window, went back to fire, fighting again, and then hit the floor to lay low for a few seconds to gasp for breath. At first, we could see the tail dragging as the pilot of the stricken fort fought for control of the ship. Smith heaved enough equipment over, including guns, ammunition, and safety devices, so that the ship flew on. Only the heavy skeleton held the plane together as the fire burned through the side. Fire reached the ammunition boxes, and 50 caliber shells began popping before Smith could get to them to throw them overboard. The wounded tail gunner was in agony, and besides giving him first aid, Smith had to lie to him to keep his courage up. Every few minutes, he would lean over him and shout, yeah, we're in sight of England now, we'll only be a few minutes longer. But it was three quarters of an hour from the first time he said that, before they saw the English coast. From the other side of the radio room, Staff Sergeant William Farenhold of Pennsylvania was also doing heroic work, but he didn't have the wounded man, and the fire was blowing away from him. Upon finally reaching England, Captain Johnson landed the battered B-17 on the first available runway that he could find, Portreath Air Base. 
Almost immediately after landing, the bomber broke in half on the runway. Miraculously, the seven crew members that were still on board of the aircraft would survive, while the three who bailed out over the Atlantic were never seen again, presumably lost at sea. Shortly thereafter, Maynard Snuffy Smith was put in for the Medal of Honor, which he was granted. But the accomplishing feat and saving his crew did not change his colorful and unique character. On the day when the brass arrived, Maynard was nowhere to be found. He was actually in the kitchen at the time, as punishment for showing up late to briefings. We can read this in detail from a newspaper on his commendation. And for those loyal fans of the TJ3 cinematic universe, you might also notice that the author of this article is Andy Rooney, one of the famous reporters that was a part of the writing 69th with Robert Post. After Post's death, he was still covering the bombers in England and was actually at the airfield when Maynard Smith's crippled B-17 landed that fateful May day. His write-up on the Medal of Honor ceremony can be read as follows. They took Maynard Smith off KP and gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor today. Henry L. Stimson, U.S. Secretary of War, draped America's highest award around the little 8th Air Force gunner's neck while Lieutenant General Jacob Devers and Major General Ira, Ica, 8th Air Force Commander, and a squad of Brigadier Generals stood in the background. Staff Sergeant Maynard Smith raises a salute from all of them now. The recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor is entitled to a salute from a four-star general. The dour little ball turret gunner who comes from Cairo, Michigan, took the ceremony in stride yesterday. All the brass, which had come to honor him for his hour and a half battle with flames and enemy fighters over France and the Channel, was just so much brass. Smith, who usually answers to Snuffy, had been on KP not so long before, peeling spuds. He was off KP for the ceremony, so there wasn't much that could really bother him. He stood quietly at attention while Secretary Stimson read the citation for the second Congressional Medal of Honor won in this theater. Jack Mathis, who died as he released his bombs over the target, was posthumously recommended for the Medal of Honor as well. The men on the station still don't know Smitty too well. They haven't made up their minds about him yet. He's a character, they say, and that's all they're sure about him. Several weeks ago, he came in after a pass a little late, and a week later, he did it again. He was put on KP as a mild form of punishment, and for the last week, he's been peeling potatoes in between raids. After the ceremony, someone asked Smith if he had any plans for the night. He didn't have any special plan. I haven't got a pass for tonight, but I think I can arrange for one, he said. Combat crews here are hardened to heroism, but the story of Snuffy Smith on his first raid May 1st over Flax City, St. Nazaire, is still talked over in Nissan huts at night. They talk about Snuffy himself, too. He is a character, not the typical American hero folks picture. This is certainly correct. He was far from the typical American hero that one would picture, and was quite a character indeed. Here we can see a newspaper highlighting him as the town bad boy, yet still becoming a war hero. This article also including a photo of his own mother, supposedly bewildered at her son's accomplishments. In the days following the mission on May 1st of 1943, where three B-17s were lost by the 306 bomb group, an explanation for the navigation debacle was listed in the post-mission report. It can be read as follows. As usual, the navigation problem was made extremely difficult by having poor compass equipment. After the French coast was crossed, all radio aids, with the exception of the J-beams, are useless due to the fact that the enemy has beacons and stations set up to jam and deacon them. It is therefore necessary to rely wholly on the compass when flying under such poor conditions as those encountered on this mission, and the compass installations at present are far too unreliable to put that much faith in them. There is a new heavy gyro compass of exceptional reliability of the remote reading type which should be made immediately available to the operational groups. The leadership and navigation displayed 
by the lead group of the 102nd Combat Wing was hardly exceptional. Signed, Lieutenant Colonel Claude E. Putnam. In the coming weeks, Maynard Smith flew only four more combat missions until he was finally grounded due to what would be listed as combat stress reaction. A few months later though, he also received a reduction in rank to private after poor job performance. Clearly, Snuffy Smith got no better at taking orders or making friends. When he finally came home in February of 1945, he was still treated as a war hero by his own town, with everything including a parade. After eventually finding more trouble later on in his life, Maynard H. Smith would pass away in 1984 at the age of 72. If you enjoyed this story, please consider joining my Patreon at the link below so I can continue to make more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.